you so much for having us here. I'm so delighted. I'm so grateful to Jahan and to Matt for all the work that you've done to make this happen at the Center for Poetry and Poetics. This is just extraordinary. And I love the persistence and determination. We're here two years after the fact and having this amazing conversation and all of you wonderful people are here to have it all together. Um, so it's a real delight. Um, and you know, I have to say, as, as Harris said, you know, Jahan's work has been so crucial to the thinking of Sonia, Harris, myself, I don't want to speak for, but um, it's, he really, to keep borrowing the metaphor, has cleared ground in the study of poetry and poetics, with transnational poetics, Heidi Muse, poetry and its others, and just his, his uh, spirit of expansiveness and intellectual generosity in thinking about poetry and poetics. So I feel like these conversations today make possible Are illuminated by the decolonial period of 
translation of transcreation, translating a cell, developed by Chikampos. Transcreation involves reinterpretation and rewriting rather than identical transmission. Jukampos writes that every translation, this is a quote, of a creative text will always be a recreation, a parallel, autonomous, reciprocal translation, transcreation. He developed this theory in relation to Brazilian modernist Osvaldo Ferraji's 1928 Cannibalist Manifesto, which you might be familiar with. Uh, it is a seminal document in Latin American letters that makes a vigorous appeal for Brazilian writers to devour the world's cultural forms and incorporate them in specifically Brazilian cultural production. Giandraji thus refuses the charge of cultural imitation by rejecting the violently enforced flow of influence from colonizer to colony. His manifesto spurred Gicampos and his brother Augusto to elaborate a cannibalist or anthropophagous theory of, quote, a transformational process of creative and transgressive translation. This has proven immensely influential for artists working across media, from the music of Gaetano Veloso to the visual art of Tropicalia to contemporary writers across Latin America and the world. So I'll say a quick word about the anthology as a whole and its material history before passing on to look closely at two key poems, one by Chilean-Mexican poet Andres Gonzalez and another by a Maya Quiche Mexican poet from Guatemala named Rosa Chavez. The anthology, Sucede que yo soy America, was published by a small press in Puerto Rico called La Impresora. It's an artist-led, women-run studio dedicated to small-scale editorial work and independent publishing, directed by Puerto Rican poets Nicole, uh, Nicole Cisnigue Delgado and Amanda Hernandez. The press specializes in rhizograph printing, which is a mechanized printmaking technique taken up by independent graphic artists and micro-publishers for its efficiency, performance, and ecological character. It's the publisher's environmentalist mission to use non-toxic materials and soy inks. Known for its underground vibe, risograph printing is often used to produce zines and posters and prints. It's the micro presses for the small press the publishers that move the Americas, declares Andres Gonzalez in his contribution to the volume. Embedding praise for La Impresora into his poem while calling out large commercial presses in the US and Spain. America, random house will never shed a tear. It's too busy manufacturing mass-produced literary generations. Anagrama keeps trying to convince us that the savage detectives, with all its lazy pessimism, is our point of origin. But there's no point, there's no origin. America, it's the micro presses that move the Americas. America, you act like you're indifferent. You send us messages on YouTube that say, this video cannot be played in your country because of copyright laws. We're sick of cynicism, hypocrisy, and the production of black subjects. And you might notice that he's spelling America with an H. What's going on there, right? Um, and we, in Spanish, H is a silent letter, so it's a kind of unreadable, unpronounceable indication. Of course, in English, it looks like ham. We think of pork products, or you know, you're a fool, or you're a ham. Um, and in Spanish, uh, a very particularity of the Chilean lexicon is, you might be familiar with this, this whole uh, iteration of words that start with H, huevón. <laughs> which means like a moron or a stupid thing. I'm being polite in my translation of those, of those uh, expletives. Um, but it may also refer to Julio Cortázar's play with uh, the, the silent age um, in some of his late 60s uh, stories to give a kind of mock elevated tone uh, to somebody making comment about uh, art in Paris in the, in the late 60s. In any, in any event, this invokes something unreadable, right? It adds a kind of surplus to, to the work. Aesthetically, La Impresora's artist books in small print run volumes is, uh, resemble those published by independent Latin American presses known as cartoneras. The first, Aloisa Cartonera, was founded by poets in Buenos Aires in 2003 as a cooperative that uses recycled cardboard from cartoneros who were waste collectors and sorters who emerged in massive numbers after the economic crisis in 2001. And by 2002, there were 40,000 people making a living and a subsistence by doing this. Cartonera publishing houses have sprung up across Latin America. I'm aware of 21 of them at this point um, that have had real staying power over the last two decades, including Atarraya Cartonera in Puerto Rico, which La Impresora editor Delgado co-founded. La Impresora thus shares the values of the Cartonera presses as a cultural project that fosters the exchange of tools 
and skills related to books through collaboration and teaches handmade uh, book binding techniques. Oh, I should say, and the cartoneros from whom the, uh, the, cardboard is, the cardboard is purchased are employed to um, paint the covers of the books and to do the book binding. So they learn these techniques and um, the, each object becomes a sort of um, erratic object. It's a, it's a unique handmade object. Um, Delgado says that this was a practical solution at a time when the access to the means of production is limited for many artists and writers. Now, the artisanal nature of the anthology published by La Impresora and its modest circulation, the first edition had 100 copies, second edition had 500 copies, the third about 300, contrast with the stature of the poet that the volume is responding to, Allen Ginsberg. Because for all his outsider status as a queer, communist, anti-establishment beat poet, uh, who underwent censorship and obscenity trials, ultimately became one of the most influential poets of his generation, with a cross aesthetic appeal, uh, lionized not just by the Beats and the New York School, but the language poets. But he's now an enduring figure in America. Delgado explained in an interview that I held with her two days ago, <laughs> this is fresh material, did I say this is a work in progress? <laughs> that the volume is a response to Ginsburg's claim to speak for others and generalize the experience of America. The poets of the ancient anthology, she said, singularized the gesture again, showing that each time the poem is renewed and re rewritten, it's a completely different landscape. It's well known that Ginsburg traveled throughout Central and South Paris, um, and Harris Feinstein has deftly traced uh, the Mexican origins of how it's approaching the Americas, for example, to show how those travels affected his writing. It's less often discussed that Ginsburg was influenced by Latin American poets such as Chile and Pablo de Roca, who gave a lecture on the importance of popular poetry at Columbia University in 1944 when Ginsburg was an undergraduate there. Uh, Ginsburg met with de Roca later when he traveled to Chile in 1960, and afterwards referred to him as the one genius who stood out. Puerto Rican scholar Jose Miguel Curet has linked Ginsburg's anaphoric witnessing and Howell and his geopolitical framework, his engagement with the political and continental terms, to De Roca's long poem, uh, Magna Carta of America. We have this uh, reference to the Magna Carta again, the Magna, uh, Magna de America. But I have to say, I, I don't have time to linger over this, but when you read De Roca, it's really hard not to hear Allen Ginsberg foretold. Um, here's uh, uh, De Roca's assessment of this, my city, the city I live in, Chicago. The stupid, monotonous, rheumatic smoke, the horizontal industrial smoke, the horizontal smoke coming from the factories, creeping over the rooftops, latching onto the evil beasts of the dusk. The chimney, the unanimous chimneys, the chimneys, endlessly smoking their enormous cigars. Okay, I have one for New York too, but I'll save it. Um, uh, so whereas in Ginsburg's vision, America is synonymous with the US, um, de Roca and the poets of this volume, Susan de Quiosa America, express the heterogeneity and the interconnectedness of the hemisphere, even as they pit what de Roca calls Yankee Landia against Surlandia, um, Yankee Land and Southland. Um, so, uh, Delgado identifies the anthology's contributors uh, as hailing. Uh, de toda Latinoamérica, from all over Latin America. Although the list includes birthplaces um, in the U.S. Some were born in Latin America on the island of Puerto Rico and moved to the mainland. Um, another was born on the mainland, moved to Mexico, and became a Mexican citizen. So to group all of these identities together as Latin American erases the presumptive difference between Latinx writers and Latin American writers. The move is not accidental, particularly when made by a Puerto Rican editor, uh, uh, when made by a Puerto Rican editor, period. When Spain ceded uh, Puerto Rico to the U.S. after 1898 in the Spanish-American War, the island became a commonwealth, neither granted independence nor given the rights of a state in the Union. And Puerto Ricans have existed in a liminal uh, territory for more than a century, geographically within Latin America, holding U.S. citizenship, yet without voting rights. So, just as Puerto Ricans have been subsumed into the American project, this anthology returns the favor. Numerous poems in the volume criticize the U.S.'s imperialism in Latin America. One such poem, my first example, is America, which I mentioned earlier, by Andres Gonzalez. Uh, Gonzalez traces the violent enforcement of putative democracy to profit motive. 
America, all these simulacra of democracy just to generate new markets. Enough already with free trade agreements. America, you can't sign a, sign a free trade agreement with death, but you already did. America, you beat and imprison anyone who dares to make a path out of their life. You ridicule and beat and imprison and disappear. Enough already. This persecution of flowers. Gonzalez is drawing here on the language of disappearance to describe the U.S.'s crimes in Latin America, thereby invoking state-sponsored violence and grave human rights violations. He's uh, referring to the Chilean military's kidnapping and murder of citizens and disposal of their bodies during the CIA-supported uh, Chilean dictatorship from 1973 to 1990. And he links these crimes to those of the Mexican narco state, responsible for the abduction and murder of 43 student teachers from Ayotzinapa Rural Teachers College in 2014. And throughout the anthology, the number 43 appears again and again and again as a form of memoriam and protest. Um, this violence is part of the legacy that binds together the continents, a free trade agreement with death, as Gonzalez puts it. He calls on America to listen to indigenous peoples, such as the Mapuche people of southern Chile, who refer to their ancestral territory as Juan Mapu. The Mapuche were not defeated by the Spanish Empire and remained sovereign until they were forcibly annexed by the Chilean nation-state in 1881. He writes, America, listen to the ferocious autonomy of the people who are never yours. Listen to Juan Mapu. America, when will your addiction to disappearing and torture end? Looking for 43, there appear graves and graves and graves and graves and graves and graves, which are the flip side of so many machines and machines and machines and machines. We suffocate in your maquiladoras and call centers. America, your national projects have been a disaster. America, I will not enter into your subcontracted wars. In any case, I'm here illegally. America, read yourself and our messy pirate of Ginsburg. Every line is an uh, America, a possibility. So we encounter a moment of self-reflexivity at the end of this poem, where uh, Gonzalez refers to the anthology's transcreations as messy pirated Ginsburg, comparing the prevalence of Latin American bootleg copies of digital culture to the volume's poetics, not unlike the metaphor of cultural cannibalism, although less somatic. Gonzalez is one of many contributors to Susanity who rename Ginsburg's America in their transcreations. Many are simply titled America with an accent mark, as in Spanish, recalling yet differentiating the broader Americas from the US. But like the H in Gonzalez's title, the tiny diacritical carries a tremendous difference on its uh, slender shoulders. America, cuando serás estrúcula? America, when will you be estrúcula? asks Delgado in a hendecasyllable line. Line. In Spanish prosody, when estrujulo indicates a stress on the anti-penultimate syllable. The fancy word in English for this is proparoxytonic. Um, not a word that I use with frequency, uh, I will confess. During Spain's golden age, rhyming words made from estrujulo were signs of technical virtuosity. And certain poets of the 20th century vanguard have made iconoclastic use um, of this as well, such as Peruvian poet Cesar Vallejo, who's one of the giants of Latin American poetry. Other poets refer to America as Pan America, making it more specific and broader at the same time, Estados Unidos de America. Uh, Nicolas Linares from Colombia titles his contribution America slash Marica, pivoting on the place names near homonym, the derogatory derogatory Spanish term marica refers to a gay man, a term that's been reclaimed by queer communities in recent decades. Other titles indicate the process that produced the poem, like Delgados, which is called traducción, translation. Javier Raya from Mexico calls it America de Allen Ginsberg remix. So <laughs> Christopher Reperes from the Rio Grande Valley meditates on the origins of the name America, which has been attributed to, as you're all probably familiar, a deformation of the name of Italian navigator and many Fucci, um, who may have actually been called um, Alberico, or an indigenous word meaning country with mountains in the middle, thought to refer to a mountain range somewhere northwest of Venezuela. And in Nicaragua, there is in fact a mountain range called Amerisque. But both of these theories have been disproven. Uh, one scholar explains them as a homonym fallacy, where words with similar orthography and pronunciation have different meanings, yet are assumed to be etymologically related. Beres, in his poem, interweaves these apocryphal histories with stanzas on Ginsburg's poetry and his relationship 
to Latin America. The third strand relates to an event that occurred around the time that the poem was composed, and all of these poems um, inscribe the date and time of, com of composition as Ginsburg did. So February 16, 2015 appears in this poem, uh, which was when a, uh, the date that a federal district court judge in Brownsville, Texas, just a 45 minute drive away from the poet's birthplace, blocked Obama's attempt to allow undocumented people to apply for work permits and legal protection, which would have helped 11 million people. Bettis' otherwise flat statements regarding the judge's decision and the history of Ginsburg's leisure, leisure travel in Latin America sharpened their bitter irony when juxtaposed with European settlers' appropriation and renaming of the Americas. And in the last example that I'll share with you, Rosa Chavez, a Maya Quiche and Prachique poet from Guatemala, draws a significant distinction between the name of the imperialist U.S. power and Abya Yala the name for the continents in the indigenous Guna language. Abiyagala has been translated as land full of maturity or continent of life. Millions of indigenous peoples throughout the Americas use this term and indigenous activists advocate its use in lieu of place names determined by colonizers. Rosa Chavez writes, Abiyagala, you were renamed and now they call you America. Abiyagala, 1492, cocoa, gold, feathers, stones. So much exhaustion accumulated in the body of the earth. Abya Yala, the shit death cycles don't end. America, get out of here with your legacy of fear and venom. I'm as tired as you are. My writing is sick like your body. America, when will you return to your origin? It's time to lift the veil that covers your history. When, you, when will you be reflected in your dead? When will you sing the names of the rebellions for your dignity? Abiyagala, your sacred books were burned, scorching in sobs. Lifting the veil on the history of the Americas is one of the poem's key interventions. Chavez expands on Ginsburg's form to braid together an invective directed at America and an appeal to Abiyagala, the spirit of the land. The identity of the speaker upon whose compelling voice the poem pivots and through which it coheres, just as in Ginsburg's poem, varies. That is, they speak for America and Abiyagala by turns, counterposing them as De Roca pits Yankeelandia against Surlandia. And here is a passage spoken from American's vantage point. The first peoples rise up against me. I don't have the chance to rebel. I would do well to consider my national resources. My natural assets are reduced to two joints of DMT, millions of genitals, my unpublishable poems that travel at the speed of silence and countless deaths and mental rebirths. I won't speak of my clandestine prisons, nor of the millions who've been extinguished in the humidity of the darkest times. The poem's impetus is ultimately a denunciation of the US, particularly CIA support of the death squads that operated during Guatemala's 36 year long civil war and led to 50,000 people disappeared, 200,000 deaths, and countless instances of torture. 83% of the people who were murdered were indigenous. Where Ginsburg, in his third stanza, shares a personal story about attending communist meetings with his mother while he was, when he was seven, Rosa Chavez, in her third stanza, laments a family tragedy that occurred when she was 13. Oops, sorry. Abiyagala, when I was 13 years old, my mom told me that in 1982, my uncle was kidnapped by a death squad. My mother was a union member, and he belonged to the guerrilla army of the poor. At that time, to be an insurgent was a wild and sincere decision. Life at the edge of death raised beings resplendent with bravery. I cried when I found out that my uncle was one of the thousands of souls who were disappeared and massacred. He was accused by people disguised as stones. Abiyagala, you never wanted war. The poem honors the lost uncle and the others murdered, aligning them with those who have fought for the dignity of Abiyagala, as she writes, indigenous heroes of the 18th century who opposed Spain, including the feminist hero Bartolina Cis, famed throughout Peru and Bolivia. Chavez offers an indigenous counter-history in Edward Said's sense, linking Spanish colonialism to the U.S.'s violent interventions in Guatemala in mid-century, and finally to present-day immigration issues at the border. She writes, America, I still haven't told you what they did to my uncle when, he was, when as a wetback, he crossed the desert to find you. Listen to me. I'm talking to you. The decolonial gesture of memorializing the heroes while contextualizing the violence is found in many of the transcreations associated with the literary history of 
history of poetry that has served this purpose since antiquity when the names of military and athletic heroes, as well as enemies, were inscribed into poems just as they might be carved into a stone for posterity. It also allies the poems of Susedeke with contemporary Latin American and Latinx poetry that recites the names of the dead, whether the names of women murdered in Juarez or those lost crossing the U.S.-Mexico border, in a form that Jahan Ramazani has identified as anti-consolatory or anti-elegies, poems that keep the wound of loss open rather than seeking psychological closure or healing. In so doing, Chavez helps herself to elements of Ginsburg's form to compose a transcreation, a devoration that produces an entirely new text proper to Chavez and her decolonial hemispheric poetics. Both Chavez and Andres Gonzalez argues that cannibalistic uh, aesthetic practice lays claim to European cultural patrimonies for the purpose of constructing a singularly Brazilian culture. The poets included here extract and adapt the most nutritious marrow from Ginsburg's poem to craft decolonial transcreations that are distinctly their own. And with these texts, they join a venerable history of Latin American poets who sing the Americas while critiquing U.S. hegemony from Jose Martí at the end of the 19th century, to Pablo de Roca, to Pablo de Nuda, and on and on and on. So just a, a quick word in conclusion. The title that the editor chose, Sucede que yo soy América, you may have been wondering, is a provocative translation of a line from Ginsburg's first stanza, which appears here. It occurs to me that I am America. I'm talking to myself again, that's what Ginsburg writes. So the speaker's expressing a kind of tongue-in-cheek, delusional identification with the nation-state, casting the poem as a soliloquy. Sucede que yo soy América would translate back into English, in this awkward exercise, as um, not as it occurs to me that I am America, but as it so happens that I am America. As in it turns out that I'm America. Naming an event that has transpired rather than a thought that strikes Ginsburg's speaker. And then another equally unexpected translation, translation also, also in the flyleaf of the anthology. So this is a book with three different titles. Me ocurre que yo soy América. It happens to me that I am America. As in, America has been foisted upon me. I have become America through no fault of my own. So through these uh, creatively translated titles, like the 30 transcreated poems, all of which translate this line differently, by the way, I'm not gonna go through them all, display the non-definitive nature of translation. So this project that I've been describing uh, not only wishes to re-signify America, but also to redefine translation. I hope to have given you just a glimpse of the, the vivacity and power um, of the texts in this volume as they spur and shape and critique and torque and revise and prolong our reimagining of Las Americas. Thank you.